Welcome, my name is Brian Rogers and I'm the president of the Jesse Helm Center. And you're here today as part of our Admiral James W. Nance lecture series. This is our third uh, lecture that, that we've had and we're grateful to our uh, supporter, the, the, the uh, Pope Foundation for supporting this lecture series. And I think it's been interesting with uh, We've talked about China in the last one. We started with Mark Thiessen kind of giving an overview of his time with Senator Helms, but also a current landscape of our foreign policy situation. And today, Dr. Rubin is going to give us a Middle East and uh, talk, and um, we'll have time for question and answers uh, on that. But uh, what I thought I would do uh, before we eat is uh, perhaps bring uh, John Dodd up here to give a, a, a little bit talk about Admiral Nance. Uh, he knew him a lot better than I did. And for those that did know him, you know what a treat uh, Bud Nance was. And so he's gonna come talk and then I'll, I'll give the invocation and then we'll be served lunch uh, for the order. So welcome John Dodd. Thank you, Brian. Um, I, this is a real pleasure for me to talk about a great American patriot. Um, Admiral Nance, I had the pleasure of getting to know him because he was Senator Helms' best friend. And uh, he was on the board of directors of the Helms Center when I came on in 1994. And he was chief of staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Admiral Nance was a, it started out in Monroe, grew up with Senator Helms, and um, they had some some great stories when they they would tell about their early days, and and I really enjoyed hearing about that as I drove them around Monroe on on occasion. But um, what I really valued from a personal standpoint uh, of the, the admiral was the advice that he gave me in my early days in the Helm Center, and um, it was a it was critical and very important to the to the success, long-term success of the Helm Center. Admiral Nance was a graduate of the Naval Academy. Um, he went on to become the, the commanding officer of the USS Forstall aircraft carrier before he was deputy national security uh, advisor to President Reagan. Then he came on to work with Senator Helms on his Foreign Relations Committee, Commission, and, and he told the senator he didn't want to take any salary. And uh, so the, the senator put, put him on, tried to put him on the, the uh, uh, I guess, the, the job role at the Foreign Relations Committee, and, and he found out he couldn't, that he had to be paid. So the, the, the admiral en, um, ended up getting paid, I think it was like $5 a year. But <laughs> that, was the kind, that was the kind of uh, man he was. He liked Senator Helms kind of cut from that the, the uh, Depression era. Uh, mold and, and they didn't take any more money than they needed. But the Admiral was a, a great um, uh, partner with Senator Helms. I mean, and Senator Helms would have called him a partner when they're uh, running the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And it was a remarkable at his funeral that I had the privilege of attending. Uh, it was in Northern Virginia and um, for, started out at the McLean Presbyterian Church. Um, there were more Democratic senators there than Republican, and there were, I'd say there's probably about 12, 14 senators. In addition was uh, Secretary of State at that time, Madeleine Albright. And then we, from there we went to Arlington Cemetery for internment. And, of course, it was a very impressive military service with the flyover and the jets and the and the single flight uh, going straight up. And, um, but the thing that really impressed me on a personal level was that Madeleine Albright came from, was there from 9 o'clock through the whole internment at, at 1230, and she's a sitting Secretary of State. That's the kind of respect that Admiral Nance um, endured from, um, you know, and from his many admirers. And so it's a great pleasure for us to have this this program named after the Admiral, and we thank the Pope Foundation certainly for, for underwriting this, and we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. 
couple months ago, uh, John Dodd and I were discussing who should be, you know, what what might make a great topic for this lecture series, and uh, and we thought that maybe talking about the Middle East, Iran, and uh, certainly there's been some some news this week in Afghanistan with a peace accord with the Taliban, and and so uh, we went to our friends at American Enterprise Institute. We have two former. Well, actually, three former Helms staffers involved there, and uh, Roger Noriega, Danny Pleka, and Mark uh, Thiessen. And um, we saw Dr. Rubin's work and thought he would be an excellent uh, choice uh, for that, and they gave him very high remarks. And so we're, we're grateful that he flew in last night to, uh, to speak to us, and we'll have a little uh, Q&A. But uh, he's a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and he specializes in uh, Iran, um, Iran, Turkey, and the broader Middle East. He also uh, is a former Pentagon official, and I asked him who he might speak with uh, quite a bit in addition to colleges and universities and groups like ours, but he also speaks to members of, uh, of our SEAL teams in elite special forces units. So um, he's uh, lived with the Taliban and and has spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Uh, he, but most important, he is uh, the proud father of two uh, young young people, seven and four. And he says he enjoyed getting some work done last night because they keep him busy in the evening. And I'm, I'm sure he misses, he'll, he'll have an audience when he returns. Maybe they'll be in bed tonight when you return. But tomorrow, for sure. So I do want to welcome, he, he is a Yale uh, graduate and uh, spent a lot of time at Yale in New Haven. So... Uh, but do welcome Michael Rubin. I, I just want to start off by saying that I was still in high school when Jesse Helms was at his prime, and I didn't really fully understand just how important Jesse Helms was to the U.S. Senate and to the functioning uh, of the country. And now in his absence, it has become so starkly clear. When I look at the dysfunction, when I look at uh, within the Senate, people not understanding the meaning of oversight and the possibilities of oversight in correcting policies, um, it's an honor to be here and to be at a center which um, honors Jesse Helms's legacy. So I want to thank you for that. Um, one of the worst things about working at a think tank like the American Enterprise Institute is whenever you are under deadline, whenever you have that book chapter that needs to be finished, that translation, that op-ed, invariably that's when you get called and you have to do the talking head bit on television. <laughs> and I was doing this once recently on CNN, which I guess has become the official network of airport delays. Yeah. <laughs> and. I went back to the green room afterwards, and there was a governor there from a southwestern state. And he had a whole entourage with him, and one of his aides said, you know, you look good up there. And I said, that's kind of funny, because my wife had just texted me and said, Michael, I thought you looked fat, bald, and mean. <laughs> the, the governor looked up from his notes and said, no, nah, I didn't think you looked mean. <laughs> the point of this is, no matter how mean I may or may not look, when we go to questions and answers, Feel free to go off the topic. We don't need to just stay on Iran. I was asked to talk specifically about the maximum pressure campaign on the Islamic Republic of Iran and where it might go and to analyze that a little bit. But I, I mean, this past year, I've spent a good deal of time in Afghanistan. I've spent a good deal of time in Syria. I go to Iraq quite frequently. Um, my first degree is in biology, so I can talk a little bit about coronavirus. Just don't ask what I got in organic chemistry the first time I took it. Um, but so we can, we can go all over in the interplay of, of some of these issues. I do want to point out that it's amazing when you just look at the big picture with regard to the Islamic Republic of Iran, that they have effectively been at war with us for more than 40 years. And they say so directly. And yet, never has a country been so wrapped in Teflon to not be held accountable for so many of its actions. It astounds me that when Secretary of State Mike Pompeo comes in 
and implements a maximum pressure campaign against Iran, the knee-jerk reaction to that is to try to exculpate Iran from its behaviors, to blame those behaviors on American pressure, or to suggest that the opposite, not pressure, but an embrace of Iran, could somehow repair the relations. The reason why this frustrates me, look, I'm a historian, and I'm actually an historian of Iranian history, thanks to that D in organic chemistry. But, <laughs> but uh, being a historian, I get paid to predict the past, and admittedly, I only get that right about 50% of the time. But there's certain things which are simply sheer facts. In 1993, Klaus Kinkel, the German foreign minister, came into office and he said that we're going to take a different approach to Iran. We want to show that the American style of cowboy diplomacy and unilateralism isn't going to work. Instead, we are going to have critical engagement where we are going to shower the Iranian um, government with trade and try to bring them back into the international community. Now, between 1998 and 2005, at the height of the so-called critical engagement, you had the price, you had European Union trade with Iran triple, and you had the price of oil quintuple. The Iranians took about 70% of that hard currency windfall and invested it in nuclear technology, which at the time was covert, as well as their ballistic missile programs. Meanwhile, by any metric which the Europeans were looking at Iran, human rights and so forth, and the other topics, um, not sponsoring terrorist groups, the other topics which they had used as justification for their new approach, they achieved absolutely nothing. Quite the contrary, you actually have had a consistent backsliding in Iran. Now, given that, it's important to understand why it is that that sort of openness and that sort of trade doesn't actually work with Iran. The devil is actually in the details. Between 1980 and 1988, there was the Iran-Iraq War. And it was like World War I on steroids for the Iranians and the Iraqis. It was trench warfare, barbed wire, mustard gas, and then on top of which you had the Scud missiles going back and forth. I mean, again, I'm an Iran nerd. Mashhad the, um, is today the second largest city in Iran. In 1988, it was the second largest city in Iran. In 1980, it was the fifth largest city in Iran. Why did it grow so, so rapidly? It was the only Iranian city out of the range of the missiles. Now, you had that Iran-Iraq war, and it was against the backdrop of the war that something called the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps came into pro um, prominence. This is the elite force, and many of people know the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps because the Trump administration has designated them as a terrorist group, but on top of which, on January 3rd, um, a U.S. Reaper drone removed the head of the Quds Force, the elite unit of the Revolutionary Guards, permanently from this earth. Now, at the, they became elite during the Iran-Iraq War. But when the war ended, Ayatollah Khomeini said he would never end that war. But then in 1980, he got on the radio and he said, it's like drinking from a chalice of poison. But I have no choice but to drink from this cup if I want the Islamic republic to succeed. And the war was just costing too much. And so he, he agreed to a ceasefire. Now, the Revolutionary Guard thought about this and didn't want to go back into the barracks, because to go back into the barracks would be to lose their elite position. So instead, what the Revolutionary Guard did was, and I say this without any moral equivalence, they took their equivalent of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and started competing in the civilian economy. Well, fast forward 30 years. Today, that unit of the economic wing of the Revolutionary Guard controls about 40% of the Iranian economy. 
just loosely speaking and again without moral equivalence. If you want to understand what Hatam al Anbiya, this economic wing of the Revolutionary Guard, is, imagine taking the Army Corps of Engineers and merging it with Halliburton, KBR, and Bechtel, and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and ExxonMobil. That's what it is, and Dell. I mean, they control all the computers, they control um, electronic manufacturing, automobile manufacturing, um, oil industry, um, pipeline construction, water diversion systems. Iran is the third largest dam building nation on earth, and they have a monopoly over dam construction. So as an Iran analyst, when I see Iranian dams going up in Venezuela or Nicaragua or Armenia or elsewhere, I know that that is staffed by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, even if they are in civilian clothes. And because of this, one of the things that makes me so grateful about being at um, the American Enterprise Institute is that they allow me to do whatever is needed for the sake of research, or put another way, they may think I'm expendable. Because last year, um, they let me go out and basically rent a speedboat in the Strait of Hormuz and watch the smuggling operations go back and forth across the Strait of Hormuz. Now, the official budget of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is about $5 billion to $8 billion per year. Those smugglers bring in another $13 billion per year. And when I was interviewing these smugglers, most of them are good, honest, apolitical, sought of the earth, family men and women smugglers. Aside from being smugglers, not a criminal bone in their body. So why is it that they contribute so much to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps' economy? The answer is, in order to dock on the rocky shores on the Iranian side of the strait, they have to pay landing fees to the Revolutionary Guard. The Revolutionary Guard gets subsidized oil and sells it at 400% markup to these guys. They have nothing good to say about the Iranians, but that contributes about $13, million, uh, $13 billion. On top of which, one of my side jobs at the American Enterprise Institute is to be the Persian language analyst for the um, Fort Leavenworth, for the US Army's Foreign Military Studies Office. And when you trace the no-bid single-source contracts, what you'll find is that the Revolutionary Guard gets between 40 and $50 billion per year that way. Now, the point of this is, if the Iranians were to have an epiphany and say that the Revolutionary Guard is, a, admit that the Revolutionary Guard is a terrorist organization and bring its official budget to zero, proportionately they would still be facing less of a budget cut than we did through sequestration. Because the, the huge bulk, 90% of their income, comes from outside the normal budgetary process. And this is why this idea of flooding Iran with trade, or during the Obama administration, giving this sort of sanctions relief and believing somehow that it was going to trickle down and benefit ordinary people, it just doesn't work. Now, while you can say that there is a problem with funding businesses which work with the Revolutionary Guard, on the other hand, a lot of the opponents of the maximum pressure campaign will say two things. First of all, because the Revolutionary Guard is so involved in smuggling, if you actually have sanctions, it empowers the Revo Revolutionary Guard. And to some extent, there's something to that. But the other thing they will say is that maximum pressure can never work. The Iranians are too proud. Well, I'm sorry. History shows that that's simply not the case. There are two instances I can think of offhand where maximum pressure has worked on the Islamic Republic of Iran. I mean, you all remember the hostage crisis that started um, during the Carter administration. It didn't, by the way, start with the Islamic Revolution. There was more than nine months between when the Islamic Revolution happened and when the hostage crisis started. And there was an additional five months before the Carter administration broke diplomatic relations with Iran, believe it or not. February 1st, 1979, Khomeini returns. November 4th, 1979, we have the, um, the embassy seizure, and then it was April 1980 
when we severed diplomatic relations because the Carter administration hoped beyond hope that by keeping the embassies open, we could have diplomatic dialogue. Now, why did the embassy seizure happen? It was because of diplomatic dialogue. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, Carter's national security advisor, had gone over to Algiers. He met the Iranian prime minister, and he said publicly, shook hands, and he said publicly he hoped that we could find a way to continue to work in order to once again become allies. Someone snapped a picture of this. It was put on all the front page of the papers. And this notion, this conspiracy, that the prime minister of the Islamic Republic was about to betray the revolution that led the students to seize the American embassy. It wasn't done, I mean, it wasn't done because the American embassy was there, because the American embassy had been there for nine months already. It was done because we were trying, and the Carter administration was trying to force diplomacy at a time when the political instability inside Iran was such that people wanted to act as spoilers. Well, needless to say, you know the rest. 52 American hostages were held for 444 days. Now, when the hostages were released on the first day of the Reagan presidency, you had a lot of the alumni of the Carter administration say that this was because of the persistence of diplomacy, that we should not credit Ronald Reagan for their release. The late, great Peter Rodman, who was an aide to Kissinger during the George W. Bush administration. I got to know him as a um, assistant secretary of defense, wrote an article back in 1981 in the Washington Journal who said, no, all these Carter administration aides have it backwards. The reason why the Iranians released the hostages was simply because the cost of holding them became too great to bear. Again, we go back to the Iran-Iraq war. The Iranian isolation was bad enough when they had the revolution. Remember, their slogan was neither East nor West, but Islamic Republic. So they were just as anti the Soviet Union initially. But they also, um, once the Iran-Iraq war started, that isolation became a matter of life and death. And therefore, the Iranian leadership made a cost. I mean, with terrorism, it's a tactic. And there's always a cost-benefit analysis to it. And he made the cost-benefit analysis that continuing to hold these hostages, especially with the specter of someone like Reagan coming into office, as opposed to the hapless Carter, was simply too great to pair. Maximum pressure worked. Now, if any of you have studied diplomatic history, you may be aware of a series of books which the U.S. State Department publishes called The Foreign Relations of the United States. Is anyone aware of these? They're in the libraries. That basically, after 25 or 30 years, the State Department will declassify the most important documents of that year. So now I guess we're working on 1990 and so forth uh, in the State Department historian's office. Well, the Iranians do something similar. And what we found uh, if you look at the Persian documents, the Farsi language documents, is that in 1982, the Iranians had already more or less pushed the Iraqis back, stalled their standstill, and therefore it was a stalemate. And Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, was considering ending the war then. But some of the revolutionary guardsmen went to him and said, no, we have to continue this battle until we achieve our aims. The aims were not only the fall of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad, but the eradication of the state of Israel as well. Well, there continued six more years of, of fighting. Another half million people died. And in the end, Khomeini drank from that chalice of poison. Why? Because one of his slogans was, we didn't have a revolution over the price of a watermelon. But after eight years of war, he discovered you might. And therefore, because of the economic pressure on Iran, Khomeini decided to back away from his stated policies. So two examples. One, what it took to release the hostages. Second, what it took to end the Iran-Iraq war are examples of where maximum pressure works. Now, looking ahead, I mean, if you think it's bad that, as a historian, I only get it half right, 
don't get me to prognosticate the future. But when we look, when I look as an analyst, we still have this problem of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. This is one of the reasons why muddle through reform has never worked. I mean, it's, it's an irony of American society that we have more faith in Iranian, um, Iranian reform than the Iranian people do. And the Iranians tell a joke about an Iranian woman who's getting married. And on her wedding night, she tells her husband, I, I'm sorry, to, I should have told you this before, but this is actually my second marriage. And the husband goes, what? She says, no, 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 don't worry, I'm still a virgin. Well, how can that be? My first husband was like Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran. He kept promising to do it, promising to do it, promising to do it. And after seven years, he didn't touch a thing. So when it comes to the Revolutionary Guard, I would argue that no matter how much maximum pressure you have, you're not going to have any substantive change in Iran until you develop a mechanism to fracture and undercut the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Now, the United States is very good at throwing money at problems. I mean, oftentimes that becomes the metric of what we're doing rather than any metric of measurable success. When it comes to Iran, therefore, I want to talk about not what we know about Iran after having invested billions in intelligence over the last four decades, but what 40 years on, we still don't know about the Islamic Republic of Iran. Number one, during that Iran-Iraq war, when you went down and you were conscripted, you served in the trenches, you didn't just go on a six or nine month deployment like the US military does today. You went until the war was over. And we have absolutely no sense of who served with whom during in the front lines in the trenches of the Iran-Iraq war. And that indicates all the informal networks which exist, especially as these people, uh, these veterans who were able to amplify their service into government jobs are now at the very senior level of the civil society. Another thing, I mean, how many of you have heard the term hardliner and reformer when it comes to Iran? It's common, you hear it a lot. That, that's about, the, first of all, the Iranians never use the term hardliner. They use in Persian usulgarian, which means the principalists, those who follow the principles of the Islamic re revolution. And these, this originated with those people in the trenches because they suffered for eight years. They made it back to Tehran and they saw all these clerics who literally had gotten fat and wealthy while they were off fighting the war. I mean, Hashemir Rasanjani was worth at least $8 billion when he died just a couple years ago. The Hashemir Rasanjani of Iran-Contra error fame. At any rate, so the Iranians will talk about principalists versus reformers. And this is one of the reasons why, when you look at how, how could the Iranians, even though their elections don't mean much, how could they ever elect hardliners? Again, because the hardliners are the ones who have the popular perception of being anti-corruption, while the reformers are the ones who are tainted with the whiff of corruption, of self-enrichment, and so forth. Now, we know in politics, this guy's a reformer, that guy's a hardliner, and so forth. But what are the factional divisions within the Revolutionary Guard? We have absolutely no clue. I mean, yeah, people have done studies that they've come up theoretically. We know it's not homogenous, but we don't know that that colonel or that general is a reformer or true believer. Well, that one's just a cynic who, who's in it for the money. And that can be very, very scary when you consider that some of these folks might have their hands in the future on a nuclear button. And I'll get to that in a second. The other thing we don't know is in 2007, the Revolutionary Guard reorganized. They had a new leader who basically said, look, Saddam Hussein is dead. The Taliban have been pushed back. The Israelis are paper tigers. And I'm quoting now, the Americans can't do a damn thing. And therefore, the biggest challenge to our society is going to be from within. And so they reorganized, instead of having the Revolutionary Guard all out on the periphery of Iran, they put one unit in every province. Now, what we don't know is whether the makeup of those units whether the people in those units are native to the provinces in which they serve. The answer to that question would go a long way to saying whether ideology trumps kinship 
if given the order to fight, if given the order to fire on crowds in the street. So those are just a couple issues we don't know with regard to the Revolutionary Guards. There's other issues. When I used to live in Iran, they used to call me Pasari Shaitani Bozorg, uh, son of the great Satan. At any rate, <laughs> one of the things which I found most astounding as I circulated around the country, I mean, when Christian Amanpour goes in for CNN, she's in northern Tehran. Gauging Iran from northern Tehran is like determining what North Carolina thinks from a coffee shop in Chapel Hill. Just uh, now. So you got a situation. You got a situation where um, we, one of the things that was sounding is I would go to neighborhoods that most people would never go to neighborhoods which were staffed by the family members of the Revolutionary Guard and so forth, is that those who were wounded in the war were treated horribly. There were no veteran services. People complain about the VA here, nothing compared to what Iranians go through. And I'm going to come back to this in a second. Other fractures that I know exist within the Revolutionary Guard. Um, you have a generation which gave their all on the front lines of fighting with Iraq. And now they're having a, kids who are old enough to enter military service. And they're telling their kids not to join the Revolutionary Guard. Why? Because I, I sacrificed so that I could get a good civil society, civil service position and put you into university. So now you should go to the university and become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer rather than join the Revolutionary Guard. And so you have that dynamic, and you also have a dynamic where even the most ardent revolutionaries, if they have had daughters, their daughters are now in their late teens or 20s. And their daughters aren't, I mean, aren't as committed to the outgrowth of that Islamic revolutionary vision as their parents were when they fought, in the, or as their fathers were when they fought in the Iran-Iraq war. And so you do have some divisions there. Now, quickly with regard to the nukes, and then I'll talk about some of the future strategy. Some people would say, who cares if Iran develops nuclear weapons? After all, they're not suicidal. You know, I agree with that. I don't think the Islamic Republic of Iran is suicidal. This is what I worry about. What if they're terminally ill? Again, we don't know the factional divisions within the Revolutionary Guard. We don't know the provincial unit makeup within the Revolutionary Guard. But what we do know is among the specialized unit, there's a great deal of ideological um, indoctrination. You can join the Revolutionary Guard bubble when you're eight or nine years old. And because they run after school programs, you can think of them like evil Boy Scouts. <laughs> but if you have, I mean, if you've been screened and if you have the control, the command, the custody over a nuclear weapon, what happens if you have a spark in Iran? I mean, freedom is contagious. And what we've seen repeatedly, whether it's in the Soviet Union or elsewhere, is that left to their own devices, people would embrace freedom. So in 1999, when I, one of the times when I was there, there was a student protest over the closure of newspapers, and they threw some students outside the, um, the security forces, threw some students out of a fourth floor window, um, killed them, and that led to nationwide protests. 2001, Iran lost three to one in a World Cup qualifier against lowly Bahrain, and the rumor spread that the Iranian team threw the match so that men and women wouldn't celebrate together in the street. And there were nationwide protests. They protested together in the street instead. 2009, you had the post-election unrest. And then since late 2018, you've had economic protests in Iran. What happens if you have a spark like you had in Romania back in the days of Ceausescu in Timisoara, I think in uh, November or early December 1989 it was. And instead of the security forces crushing that spark, some of them join in. And you have a um, momentum where it becomes obvious that the regime is about to fall. In a situation like that, if you have the most ideologically pure unit of the Revolutionary Guard having a nuclear weapon at their capacity, what's to stop them from using against Saudi Arabia, Israel, or American forces? After all, would you really retaliate against a country that already had regime change. I mean, Chuck Wald, the four-star retired, now retired Air Force general, 
who led the initial U.S. air campaign in Afghanistan, defined uh, containment as the ability, I mean, containment and deterrence are military strategies. They're not rhetorical strategies. He defined containment as the ability of all the states in the region to wage war independently with Iran until the Americans can get there. And he defined deterrence as the willingness to kill three or four million Iranians. I mean, would if you had Iran in its, la the Islamic Republic in its last grasp, um, gasp, use a nuclear weapon and then the government fell, would you gratuitously kill three or four million Iranians? And the answer to that's probably no. But that's where the whole mutually assured destruction problem breaks down. Now, I, um, when it comes to the maximum pressure campaign, what I spend a lot of my time doing at the American Enterprise Institute is thinking, how can we fracture? If this is the main impediment to either muddle through reform, which I don't think will work, or any sort of regime change coming from within, I don't mean like Iraq-style regime change. How are we, how can we advance this? And while it's important, while maximum pressure has a role, I've spent uh, several years of my life in Iraq. And one of the things that most people don't realize about Iraq is through the 1970s, it was the least corrupt Arab state. And now, I mean, when I first went to Iraq in the year 2000, they told a joke, how can you tell an honest Iraqi general he's the one driving the taxi? Because he didn't embezzle enough when he was a general. Um, at any rate, we went in, we weren't expecting to go in in 2003, but one thing led to another, we can debate that decision afterwards, and had to rebuild Iraq. And corruption had become so dysfunctional that the society is still suffering from that. That's what those protests are about. Remember, 40% of Iraqis were born after the 2003 war. And therefore, they don't remember Saddam Hussein. They just know today's corruption. So when we look at Iran, if we're creating such maximum pressure, are we going to eviscerate the economy to the extent that when you do have a change, it can't be rebuilt? After all, these people are supposed to be our allies in the future. Now, I don't want to be all Pollyanna-ish. But the other thing I want to look at is when it comes to that, um, to Iran, I mean, you have the pressure, but how do you actually fracture the Revolutionary Guard? After all, I mean, you can put a lot of pain on the Iranian society and people. You can put a lot of pain on North Korea, but the nature of dictatorships is they really don't care about the welfare of their people. So one of the things I would suggest that we should be doing is, for example, we have hospital ships in the U.S. Navy, the USNS Comfort, for example. It wouldn't cost much money to send it to Dubai or Abu Dhabi and offer Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps veterans free medical care. If they come and they take it, that's a propaganda coup for us, an intelligence coup. If they don't take it, that just sows greater divisions within the Revolutionary Guard, and that, I would argue, is worthwhile. Why don't we shame? I mean, while we like to self-flagellate in Washington, everything Iran is doing is Donald Trump's fault. Why don't we shame the progressive left and also um, the European Greens? Why is it that the only two countries in the Middle East with independent labor are Israel and Iran? And Iran, it's only a recent phenomena. I think George W. Bush missed this opportunity, his Lekwalensa moment, when for the first time, Iranian bus drivers went on strike, an illegal strike. Um, but they refused to go back to work because of, of back pay and working conditions and so forth. The Iranians denied that there was a strike, but they were left reading their newspapers saying there is no strike as none of the buses came to drive them to work in a city of 14 million people. In the end, the Iranians recognize this independent labor union and others have come. Why, don't, why is it that the Europeans are willing or the AFL-CIO is willing to support independent labor everywhere except in the Islamic Republic of Iran? And I'll be cynical. If there is a strike in the oil industry, well, first of all, the more Iranians, I mean, it's like Lech Walesa in 1981 in Poland. The more Iranians in this case, um, since the Revolutionary Guard controls 40% of the economy, if they're forced to pay back wages, that's less money for missiles. At the same time, cynically speaking, if it leads to a strike in the oil fields, I'm not going to shed any tears about that. And if it leads to a cycle that actually leads to change, fine. But why is it, I mean, why can't we call out the progressives on this?
The last thing I just want to say, and then there, I mean, there are other strategies, and Iran actually has a robust press. It's controlled, but it's robust. Well, when you read something about a judge who was, I mean, prostituting girls from an orphanage, and it's in an Iranian newspaper, why not have Voice of America take that story and read it publicly? The Iranians can't dismiss it as propaganda because it's coming from their own newspaper. We're just taking local news and amplifying it in a very public way. The final thing I would say, and then we can get to questions and answers, is one of the things I don't understand as we analyze our own foreign policy is why we assume that the Iranians don't have agency or our other adversaries in the region. No one makes them sponsor terrorism. They do that on their own because they think it's worthwhile. No one makes them increase the amount of enriched uranium they have or deny weapons inspectors. You may not like Donald Trump, but it's not Donald Trump that makes them do that. It's their own decision. And frankly, it's racism to suggest that the Iranians don't have agency. And I mean, I'm just talking about Donald Trump now because he's the president. I would say the same thing about Barack Obama or something uh, or, or George W. Bush. I mean, the fact of the matter is we're too willing to assume that the world revolves around us and we forget that these people have the ability to make their own decisions. Now, let me conclude with this. Um, as some of you may know, my wife um, grew up in the Soviet Union. Um, my father-in-law was sent out to Kamchatka for refusing to join the Communist Party. And my, my wife was pilloried for refusing to join the Young Pioneers. Um, and so in our, I, I live in a bilingual household. Our kids are learning Russian as well. Um, there, and I hear a lot of Russian jokes. And there's an old Russian joke about the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. The Russian pe pessimist is the one who says, you know, we look at the world today, we look at our society, and things have never been so bad. I mean, we look at poverty, we look at pollution, we look at war and instability in Russia. Um, things couldn't possibly get worse, the Russian, optimist, uh, the Russian pessimist would say. And the Russian optimist is the one who says, no, 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 they can always get worse. <laughs> so unfortunately, when it comes to the Middle East, I have to admit that I'm a bit of an optimist. But with that, why don't I open the floor to questions and answers? Thank you. <laughs>